Uh, this is, as has already been mentioned, the last week of this focus on a thousand generations. Uh, we've been inspired by these words uh, from the song, The Blessing, these words of Scripture. We'll, we'll sing this song together in just a moment. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. And in addition to those words, we have been speaking specific words of blessing over one another at the conclusion of each of our services. We'll do it again today. May the beautiful inheritance that is ours be a gift that others receive for a thousand generations to come. So several weeks ago, we began with a focus on legacy and generosity, and we talked about this beautiful heritage, beautiful inheritance that we speak of is that the faith that first, first lived in others ha has come alive in us. We recognize that it is the generosity of the generations that have preceded us that ena have enabled us to be uh, where we are today, and we connected those words in this particular way, that our legacy will be the measure to which we live a generous life. It's what we all know to be true already because of all those who have come before us who have poured in, into us. We remember their legacy and their legacy uh, is inseparable from their generosity. Last week, we looked at a focus on the next generation, and in particular, we looked at words from the Apostle Paul written near the very end of his life to a young man named Timothy, the one who he described as his son in the faith. And, and Paul, in entrusting his, his mantle of leadership to Timothy, he shared with him several things. The first thing he said to him, I want you to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Paul speaks of his own life, what he had given to Timothy as something he had deposited in him, he had entrusted to him, but he also added this, what I am depositing in you must one day be entrusted to another. Paul understood that the gift that he was giving was one that, that, that Timothy would have to steward well, and one day, Timothy was going to give that to another. The idea that we looked at is that faith lives in people who one day will die. That's the story of the church. Faith lives in people who one day will die. So the kingdom advances one generation at a time. And if our desire is to bless a thousand generations to come, that begins with blessing the next generation. And then in this final week, we're, we're focusing on making our commitment together, which, which means that as we close today at the end of our message, uh, we're going to invite you forward, if this is a place that you call home, to bring forward uh, these commitment cards. Now, if you're a member here, you should receive one of these in the mail. If you didn't bring it, there's one in the, in the pew pocket in front of you. Uh, if you already turned it in, some of you like to get your homework done early. You've already turned it in. Here's what I want to invite you to do. Just grab a blank card. So that we all can come forward because we're doing this as a way of expressing our commitment to one another to resource the mission that we share of making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ who love God, love others, and serve the world. And so at the conclusion of the message, as we sing these words of blessing over one another, I want to invite you to come forward to share those cards of commitment. But today what I want to do, I really want to do two things. I want to look at the life of Joshua in a specific critical moment in the life of Joshua. And then I want to share with you, as I have in recent weeks, I want to share with you another one of our stories. So first we're going to look at Joshua chapter 1, but in order to do so, it's important to know what happens right before that. The book of Deuteronomy, it ends with the death of Moses. So Joshua's life was very similar to Timothy's life in that he was the next generation. He was one who followed a giant. Moses, who had led Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, he comes to the, to the very end of the journey, right before Israel, the Israel enters into the promised land. God takes him up to the top of Mount Nebo and shows him the land, but tells Moses, you will not enter into it that is for another. And so the end of Deuteronomy, we, we, we hear about the death of Moses, but we also hear this, that Joshua, Joshua was the one who was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses 
had laid hands on him. So that's where we finish in the book of Deuteronomy with this once great leader passing on and Joshua, uh, we are told, is the one who has been given the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So with that in mind, we now turn to Joshua chapter one, verse one, and it says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. So if you go back to uh, verse two, I want you to notice something that's a bit peculiar. I want you to notice the way the Lord begins his commission to Joshua. He begins by telling him something that he already knew. Not only Joshua, but something all of Israel knew. He begins by saying, Moses is dead. And we can imagine Joshua at that moment thinking, I know, I mean, I was there, I saw him die. Why, why are you telling me that Moses is dead? But there is this, this, this notion here that in order for Joshua to receive his charge, in order for Joshua to receive the commission that God had given to him, God wants to first remind him of what has already happened, that this once great leader, mentor, the great hero of the faith who had done these amazing things in his life, bringing Israel all the way to, to the, right up to the shoreline of the Jordan River, God wants to remind Joshua that Moses is dead. Moses is gone. And those, those five words there, my, Moses, my servant, is dead, the importance of them is seen in the three words that follow. God says to Joshua, now, then, you. Moses is dead, Moses isn't coming back. Now, then, you. So from the very beginning, before before Joshua can even receive the full commission of what he has been called to do, before he can receive the mantle of leadership that Moses had carried all throughout his life, that he was now going to carry forward for the people as he led them into Israel, God seeks to undermine the number one thing that would have kept Joshua from fulfilling the part that he was called to play in Israel's story. God essentially says, don't even for a moment look over your shoulder thinking there is someone else who can do what I am commissioning you to do. Because this once great leader who had led Israel all of these years, the one who you had shared life with, who you learned from, who who, who you were there all along the way, he is gone and he's never coming back. There's no reason to look over your shoulder thinking someone else can do what now I am commissioning you to do. God begins with something that Joshua already knew. Moses is gone, now then you. But if you look at verse five, it's important for us to recognize that God doesn't say you should just forget about Moses. What he says to him is, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. The goal that that God has for Joshua isn't that he would forget all the lessons that he learned, isn't that he would set aside everything that he experienced with 
with him, those opportunities that he had to stand next to him, at those moments of great success and joy, and and those moments that he had the chance to to be right there with him, and, and in his moments of sorrow and grief, he doesn't ask Joshua to set that aside and to simply forget who Moses was for him in his life. Instead, God says to him, what I did in his life, I will do in yours. Who I was for him, I will be for you. As I was with him, so I will be with you. And like Joshua, today we come forward with this same charge, hearing these words of encouragement and blessing from God. As I was with them, so I will be with you. As we celebrate what has come before we recognize that God is continuing to carry the story forward. We celebrate the faithfulness of God, recognizing that God will be faithful, that they, all those who came before us, finished well. But that doesn't mean that they finished the work. So with that, again, as we prepare to make our commitment, I want to share with you one of our stories. And if this is your home, even though this is a story that almost all of you have never heard before or or have no knowledge of, I want you to hear that it's your story too. Because it's a story of your church and your church's faithfulness and and what has happened in the generations that have preceded you. So it was the fall of 2008 when our senior pastor at the time, Mike Ramsdale, returned from a gathering of large churches across the country. And what he brought back to us was a particular vision that over the next five years, we were going to start five new worship services. Now, Mike didn't know exactly how we were going to do that, okay? He simply brought to us this vision, five new services over the course of the next five years, and then he invited us to to dream with him, to begin to think about what that might look like for us and for our church. Now, we knew that there was one in particular that we were definitely going to launch, work that we felt called to. We knew that we were going to be launching a new service that would also launch a brand new ministry, which was Celebrate Recovery. So there you go. We had one, but there was four more. And so from there, we began to think about, well, when are these services going to happen? We had our Sunday morning services at that time. We also had a Saturday night service that that I preached at that particular time. But when were we going to have these other services? That was the first question uh, that we began to wrestle with before we came to the equally important question, which was where are these services going to take place? Because to, t- to start a brand new service in this room is, is well, it's hard, okay? This room seats a thousand people, uh, critical mass in this space, it's, it's hard to find. Uh, so we needed a different space. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, wasn't the obvious choice that you would start these new services in the chapel? Yes, but here was the problem. In 2008, the chapel wasn't the chapel, This is part of the story that many of you don't know. The chapel wasn't the chapel because in 1998, when the church built this new worship space, they took the chapel and they renovated it into a space where the center aisle of the chapel was a hallway and on either side were classrooms. Because in 1998, when this new space was open, that was the most critical need for the church to have those classrooms. And so that's what was there in 1998. We didn't have a chapel that we could meet in, but as we began to discern and think more about what our next steps needed to be, we felt like we needed to take the step of renovating the chapel again back to its original purpose of being a secondary worship space for us. And then we ran into the next problem, which was that we didn't have the money to do that. Now, at that time, it wasn't a great deal of money. We kind of had a sense of what that would be through volunteers and the generosity of the contractor that was going to be doing that work for us, but it was money that we didn't have. So at the end of 2008, we simply began to wait And Mike said to us what I heard him say countless times in the 10 years that I worked with him. He said, we're going to trust that God will provide. 
which in that instances and many other, I received as a very frustrating response. (laughs) As a young person who was ready to run and ready to go, and he said, we're just going to trust God. I thought, okay, we're just going to sit around and, and trust God. Now, to understand what happened next, I actually need to take you back a little over 30 years before to March of 1975. And in March in 1975, a, a couple here in our church uh, who most of you never knew, uh, uh, never had the chance to meet, uh, a couple by the name of Ola and Lena Green, they finalized their will. And in doing so, they named the church as the secondary beneficiary of their estate. Now, the church didn't find that out until the fall of 1983. After Ola passed away, the church was made aware uh, that according to their estate planning, the, the estate would first pass to their daughter, Billy, and after Billy passed away, it would eventually uh, be given to the church. Now we fast forward again a quarter century. We go from 1975 to 1983, we're back at 2008, we're back at this place where all we've, we've heard from our senior pastors, we're just going to trust God uh, to make those resources come our way. And what we didn't know at that time is that Billy had passed away that previous spring in the spring of 2008. And so in January of 2009, we didn't have to wait very long, we received a letter letting us know that Billy had passed away and the plans that Ola and Lena had established in 1975 that the church would receive their estate, that was about to happen. Now, for those of you who may be wondering, it wasn't millions of dollars. But we didn't need millions of dollars. We needed about $130,000 to do the work of transforming that space back into its origin, for its original purpose, a worship space where we could gather, launch these new services, a place where Celebrate Recovery could start and all of these other things that we had planned. And so we went about the work of tearing down the hallway and the classrooms, which, which worked out pretty well because if you attended a class in that space, you might notice there's a little bit of a ramp here in our worship space. There also is in our chapel space, which means that if you were there, you, slet, you sat slightly to the, to the left or slightly to the right most of the time. It wasn't the best space, but it was space that was utilized well for 10 years. But we went about the work of transforming it back to this worship space that we could use. And over the course of the years since 2008, uh, we've used that space in remarkable ways. Again, we launched Celebrate Recovery, which still meets in that space every Thursday night at 6.30. We have celebrated the lives of countless saints in that beautiful chapel space. We've launched several new services in that space. And next week, we're launching another one. Uh, with Pastor Thomas serving as the lead pastor uh, of the service that will begin next Sunday, which means, by the way, that next week when you walk in here, if you come to 930, there will be less people in here, just so you know. And it isn't because they disappeared, it's because they'll be there at 11 o'clock. In fact, let me, let me just add this. Some of you, I want you to go over there. I want you to be there to help get that started. And that may even become for you your primary service that you're going to come to week in and week out, a place where you can gather and worship, a place that was made possible because a gift that was given so long ago. In 1975, the church was five years away from building a sanctuary here on this property. In 1975, they were many years prior to to having any knowledge. They never could have imagined that less than 20 years later, a new worship space would need to be constructed here to accommodate the tremendous growth that happened in the life of this church. They never would have imagined that that original space would be transformed to classrooms and used uh, over the course of, of a decade. And they never would have imagined that we would be in a place where we now have this, this great resources for the, for the church to gather and for a new service to begin next week. Ola and Lena never knew, never could imagine what their gift would do. They never knew that that gift was the answer to the prayers that we were praying in 2008. 
There's a bookmark that I keep in my Bible. It has a prayer, and part of the prayer that always just grips my heart is this. I will remember that the tiniest seeds become the tallest trees, that the seeds of today become the shade of tomorrow, that the faith of right now becomes the future of the everlasting kingdom. Ola and Lena are but two name, two names among thousands and thousands that have defined the faithfulness of this church over the course of the last 139 years. And we come to the altar today prayerfully asking, God, would you add my name to the names of those whom you have named as faithful? Jesus, I give to you what I have acknowledging that I am willing to be forgotten so that you never are. The only name that I need to be known by is the name Faithful. And so as we sing these words of blessing over one another, I want to first invite you to stand. Just so you can stretch your legs a little bit. It makes the next moment a little less awkward, okay? You're invited to come if you want to pray at, at, here at, at the altar for your church. I would encourage you to do that. But first, let me lead us into this time with a word of prayer. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, our prayer is simple. Would you find us faithful? Even as we think of all those who have come before us and we remember that as you were present with them, you will continue to be with us. As you were faithful in their life, we trust, Lord, that you will continue to be faithful in ours. We will remember that tiny seeds grow into tall trees. That those seeds we plant today become the shade of tomorrow. That our faith right now becomes the future of the everlasting kingdom of which, of which we get to play a part. And so, Lord, would you remind us that there is no looking over our shoulder, that there, we are the only ones who can do what you have called us to do. And we, Lord, hear again this great challenge in these words of, of hope and blessing that you first shared with Joshua. Be strong and courageous. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you every place where you set your foot. No one will be able to stand against you. Be strong and courageous. May, that, may those words, Lord, may they define our life today and in all the days that you give us that are to come. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.